Welcome to the CEC report for the 6th of April 2018. I'm Elisa Barwick and joining me today is CEC leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome Craig. Thanks Elisa. And on today's show, that's not a people's bank, this is a people's bank. And British caught in lies yet again about Russia. So firstly Craig, that's not a people's bank, this is a people's bank. We're going to tell you today about our long-term proposal for a people's bank as opposed to what the Greens have promoted this week. So on Wednesday at the National Press Club, uh, the Greens leader, Richard Di Natale, put out a call, as he did uh, a year ago at the same venue, for a people's bank. Uh, and this, of course, in the current environment of a lot of hatred for the banks and the ongoing Banking Royal Commission, uh, Craig, has caused great consternation and concern about the directionality, because we'll explain that this really is not what a people's bank should be. However, um, the concerns raised in the minds of the banking establishment um, are not assuaged by that because they know the direction it's going into and they know our presence behind the scenes mm. in creating support for such an idea of national banking. So according to the Australian Financial Review, for instance, uh, former, wealth, former Commonwealth Bank head David Mar Murray, who headed the financial system inquiry, of course, has said that the Greens' proposal was a covert way to, quote unquote, nationalise the banking system. Um, now, there are many naysayers about whether this can even be done, of course, and you had various economists speaking out about that. Um, it won't happen. You had the Labor Party um, also doing the same. Now, don't believe them, though, because this can be done. It has been done in Australia's history. Well, that's the interesting thing, Lisa. And just to remember, for our viewers, we are coming up to a federal election. So what you're going to see is infrastructure proposals rolled out that people really want this bank proposal, the People's Bank idea, people want control over the banking system. So the Greens are, they're, they're, you know, in, in a sense, they're in a bit of electoral trouble at the moment because they're mm. losing support, yep. right? And that's where they're, they're going to roll out these populist-type policies, whether well, they think of populist policies, in order to garner your support. Mm -hmm. the, the problem for them is that they've come with a policy that we've been supporting for nearly 30 years. And in fact, they, 30 years. And they really don't understand the policy. No, that's right. And uh, look, the, this, the policy of what we call a people's bank in our case is actually a national bank. And national banking is a bank that supports the physical economic development of the nation. When we talk about physical economy, we're talking about those productive parts of the nation that have to be supported through large amounts of credit. Now, he's come out and said, oh, we're going to use the People's Bank in the form of the Reserve Bank to give yeah. cheap loans, cheap housing loans to first home buyers. That isn't part of the physical economy of the nation. Yeah, public housing is, right? We would use a national bank to fund public housing, but when people are looking at buying their private housing, that's not the function of a People's Bank or a national bank. A national bank has to fund, a th fund things like large-scale infrastructure development projects for rail, for water projects, for hospitals, the building of hospitals and things that we absolutely need, schools, uh, energy projects. And look, you know, the government today can't even decide on building new power stations. And we're into a massive problem with power in this country because of the privatisation that's gone on in the last 40 years. This policy of economic rationalism is coming crashing down on this government's head. And they can't even agree to, buy, to use our resources of coal-fired power mm -hmm. to build new power stations. So a national bank... What we proposed and have proposed for 30 years, right, and it's on the record, go back and look at 1994. We, we started calling for a, a People's Bank back then. To, uh, actually, in 2001, we wrote our book, What yeah. Australia Must Do. At that particular time, Elisa, we proposed the creation of the Commonwealth National Credit Bank. And what we said is that we would take the then existing government-owned Commonwealth Bank and transform it into a national bank. We wrote the legislation for that and how to do that. It's, it's in all very, very much detail. Unfortunately, the Commonwealth Bank began to become privatised. No longer, we no longer have a government-owned bank that we can transform. So we're going to rewrite that legislation, redraft it to create an actual national bank. The same principles apply to what we wrote back in 1994. Mm. But this is the direction that we actually have to go in our country with what we've also been campaigning a lot on, and people who've been watching this show would see that we absolutely need to have Glass-Steagall, which is the separation of commercial banking, that's the boring banking side of things, 
from the highly speculative investment and merchant banking. And in the last two weeks, we've had Denise Braley on this program elaborating in great detail uh, just the, the enormous amount of corruption, but also the vulnerabilities of our banking system and how it's absolutely screwed the Australian people. Mm. And speaking of which, because of course the housing bubble and the mortgage fraud that went on was a big part of that. And if you look at the current system we have, where we have this massively overinflated housing bubble, this Greens proposal is merely going to play into the dynamic afoot here and fuel the housing bubble even further by allowing people to come to this so-called People's Bank to borrow you know, half a million dollars at 3% interest so it's basically going to take off and fuel the bubble and prop up the banks over the longer term. So you have to ask the question, is that what they intend? Because that would be the impact. And especially when you've got it run under the Reserve Bank, which is an independent institution run by private bankers, um, it's really going to have a drastic impact in worsening the situation. So you would have to, with Glass-Steagall, type regulations and an orderly bankruptcy procedure deflate the housing bubble before you could take this kind of an approach. Of course, it is going to come down anyway, um, but we need to have the controls in place to make sure that the people are protected. And speaking of the people being protected, uh, the Greens supported the bail-in bill, which was the law that passed on the 14th of February to give powers during a crisis to confiscate certain bonds, and it does not exclude the confiscation of deposits because an amendment to make that explicit was rejected. We well, actually raced through the parliament with no one's knowledge, at least. In fact, we discovered that most of the politicians that are in the parliament didn't know that this bill was coming up for passing. Mm. We actually told them that, look, it's all gone through. What? What do you mean? We weren't told about this. Mm. So there was a lot of underhand stuff done. And the point is that this bill's gone through. Yes, it doesn't specifically say that uh, the APRA has the power to bail in deposits, that is, confiscate deposits. Mm -hmm. But see, the key here is it does not exclude it. Yeah, and APRA and has extraordinary powers, and yep. to do so in secrecy, to make changes, to do pretty much whatever they like, as they've been doing. Um, and so if the Greens want to talk about the people's money being safe, they need to come out and amend or dump this uh, APRA bill, this, this bail-in bill, because certainly the money in their people's bank is not going to be safer than in any other bank because it all comes under the purview of this new law. Yeah, listen, it all comes down to a political policy. Do you have a banking system that's run by private bankers for the sake of private bankers and for the government that's owned by the private bankers, which is what we've got now? The Reserve Bank is nothing more than a private institution. Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a quasi-government it's a, it's a government institution. The Reserve Bank of Australia is a government institution, but it's run by private bankers. Mm, yep. right? And people have to understand that policy is supported. The po private banking policy is supported by the private bankers mm. in that Reserve Bank yeah. uh, institution. So we have to take a quick break, but we'll come back and we'll have a quick update on what's happening in the Bankers Royal Commission right after this. Welcome back to the CEC Report where we're talking about a people's bank. Now, a quick update on the progress of the Royal Commission because all of the exposure of what's really been going on in the banking system is really driving support in, within the public for regulations such as Glass-Steagall, as we just talked about, and also for a better banking system, which would include certainly a people's bank, but specifically a national credit bank that would fund the development of the nation, as we've written legislation for. Um, now, this week, Treasurer Scott Morrison told the Australian Financial Review's Banking and Wealth Summit that the issues raised by the Banking Royal Commission are not things that the government was not aware of already. And he basically said it's a big waste of money, you know, rah, rah, rah. Uh, Wayne Byers, the head of APRA, has likewise brushed off the results coming out of these hearings. There were a whole um, lot of documents that were tendered to the Royal, Commission's, Royal Commission from banks that have revealed, for one thing, APRA's frustration with banks failing to identify their data and certain figures like, for instance, the proportion of home loans taken out as investment properties. Um, and so these are the kind of things that Wayne Byers is brushing off, but 
as we know, because um, we had an insider from APRA who was a former APRA data collection manager, and we've, you can call in for a copy of our Australian Alert Service um, to find out more on all of these topics, but he, this former APRA employee about, um, well, in September last year actually, uh, made it very clear from his position inside that institution that APRA never insisted on accurate data um, and it even protected the banks from requests from the Reserve Bank to provide the data that they required um, to monitor and to run, you know, to take top-down oversight of the mortgage um, industry within this country. Um, now, the Australian Financial Review reports that APRA knew it was being provided with inaccurate data by the banks and particularly the Commonwealth Bank. So APRA was on top of all this. They're, they're aware of all this. But Byers's attitude to how to deal with this was summed up quite well when he spoke to the, himself, he spoke to the AFR Banking and Wealth Summit about the structures governing executive pay and accountability which allowed the banks to avoid punishment, he said, it's not about heavy handed punishment. It's not about heads on sticks on those things. <laughs> so actually, Craig, this is quite good because both Scott Morrison and Wayne Byers here are basically crafting their own nooses quite nicely with a bit of assistance from the Royal Commission. Yeah, well, Elisa, we've always called for what's called a Precora Commission, which is what happened in the 1933 period before the Glass-Steagall bill was brought in, whereby you actually jail a few bank bankers. Yeah. There's no real criminal penalties for either the regulators doing the wrong things or the banks doing the wrong things. No one was jailed in the United States, for example, after the global financial crisis, where you saw trillions of dollars of fraud. And this is the problem, is that there's no accountability, real accountability inside APRA or inside the banks themselves for the sort of fraud you know, activity that's going on. Yep. And the Royal Commission, it's so short. I mean, yeah. in terms of the uh, time frame that's been given to the Commissioner, who may be a bit frustrated by this too, who has to work within the terms of reference, can't actually dig deeper into some of the actual criminal criminalities of what's been going on here. And you know, there's no, no potential for criminal sanctions. So, uh, you know, it's some of the frustrations of this yeah. Royal Commission. And speaking of which, um, if you haven't already, contact your Member of Parliament to demand that the terms of reference be expanded of the Royal Commission to allow the structure of banking itself and the regulation of banking, i.e. APRA, to be examined. Because, you know, if the Commissioner can only look at the wrongdoings of the banks in various cases, without looking at the top-down apparatus that allowed all of this to happen and make recommendations on that, then it's really going to get nowhere. And you can also write to the Commissioner, we'll put up on the screen the email address, to ask the Commissioner, Kenneth Hayne, to expand or to demand that his investigation be given a longer term and a greater, broader terms of reference to analyse all of these questions. Um, so that's something that all viewers can do to make a big impact. Um, now, we'll stop there and after the break, we're going to come back and talk about the British lies about Russia and how they are unravelling as we speak. Welcome back to the CEC Report. British caught in lies yet again about Russia. So we're talking here, Craig, about the uh, attempted or the so-called attempted assassination of the Russian, former Russian British double agent, Sergei Skripal and his daughter. Uh, you can read more about the background of this story in the Australian Alert Service. We don't have time to go through all of that today. Um, we've documented extensively the various holes in the story and broader questions, such as Skripal's connections to a nest of MI6 agents who ran or are running the Russiagate scandal against Trump and it was they who actually interfered in the US election, in fact, and that story is coming out with the role of Cambridge Analytica more and more every day, as people might have heard even in the media. Now, Christopher Steele, um, who was the guy who wrote this famous Ru Russiagate dossier, making all sorts of allegations about Donald Trump and his connections with Russia, he was an MI6 officer in Moscow when Skripal 
um, turned to become a British agent. Skripal's handler was an Orbis consultant. Orbis was Steele's or is Steele's company. And the UK ambassador to Russia, Andrew Wood, who fed the Steele dossier to John McCain to get it out in the US, is an Orbis associate. So, and it goes, there's much more than that. We're just giving a very um, quick indication. I think, Elisa, what's really important here is when Donald Trump came in as a new president, he wanted to have better relations with Russia, mm. first and foremost. And every time he's tried to do this, you've had attacks on the Russians uh, in order to try and break that potential for real collaboration. If you had real collaboration between Russia, a nuclear superpower, and the United States as a nuclear superpower, and a peaceful uh, cooperation between those two, which is what Donald Trump was looking for, mm. then this will change world dynamics. Yeah. And that leaves Britain out in the cold. Yeah. And this is what you're seeing here. It's just all these operations is to destroy that relationship, potential for that relationship. And despite everything, he's still pursuing it because he's been discussing, he had a discussion with Putin the other day and there's discussions about him having invited Putin to the White House for talk. So, you know, everyone's going bonkers about that. Mm -hmm. But this whole um, Skripal saga is backfiring big time um, in the United Kingdom. And we're going to show a series of videos here just to illustrate the recent developments. On the 4th of April, Gary Aitkenhead, who's the chief executive of Porton Down, which is the top secret British science laboratory that does um, work on chemical um, weapons and so forth, investigations into that, and they're located just a few miles away from where this poisoning occurred. So he told Sky News uh, that this agency has not been able to show that the nerve agent used in the poisoning originated in Russia. So we'll roll that clip. We, um, in terms of our role, um, were able to identify it as Novichok. Um, to identify that it was a military-grade nerve agent. Um, we have not verified the precise source, um, but we provided the scientific information to the government, who have then used a number of other sources to piece together um, the conclusions that they've come to. But you have not been able to establish at Porton Down that this was made in Russia? As I said, it's our job to provide you know, the scientific evidence that identifies what the particular nerve agent is. We identified that it was from this family and that it's a military grade nerve agent, um, but it's not our job to then say where that actually was manufactured. Is it possible to establish where these things are manufactured? It can be established through a number of different input sources, which the, which the government has access to. Um, from our perspective, scientific evidence is only one of those sources and it requires a number of other things in order to, to verify that. So to be clear, you're not able at Porton Down to say where it is from? At this stage, with the work that we've done thus far, we've been able to establish that it's Novichok or from that family. Um, we are continuing to work to help to provide additional information that might help us get closer to, you know, the, the question that you asked, but, but we haven't yet been able to do that. So this has caught the um, UK Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson out in a lie because he had said that he was told by Porton Down that they did know it was from Russia. Um, so this is, we're going to show a clip of him speaking on German TV, which is all over the place. Um, now, just before he comes in, the interviewer has asked him, you argue that the source of this nerve agent, Novichok, is Russia. How did you manage to find it out so quickly? Does Britain possess samples of it? So here's Boris's response. But when I look at the, at the evidence, I mean, the people from, from Porton Down, the, the, the uh, laboratory... So they have the samples, they yeah. They do. And they... And they they, they were absolutely categorical. And I asked the guy, myself, I said, are you sure? And he said, there's no doubt. So um, I, we have very little alternative but to take the action that we have taken. 
Now, the same day it also emerged that the Foreign and Commonwealth Office had deleted a tweet, and we'll put it up on the screen, it said, analysis by world leading experts at the Defence, Science and Technology Laboratory at Porton Down made clear that this was a military grade nerve agent produced in Russia, and that had been put out around the same time that Johnson had made his comments. So they also obviously realised they'd been caught out in a lie because they've deleted that tweet and the Russians asked questions about why they did that. Um, now, we'll play a clip also of Jeremy Corbyn, the Labor Party leader, because, of course, he came under enormous attack for daring to ask for proof and sa provide samples of the agent to Russia and so forth, and they've used this as the excuse for a major tirade against him. So, in this clip, Corbyn um, makes clear that Johnson has major questions to answer. He claimed categorically, and I think he used the words 101%, that it had come from Russia. Port and Down have not said that. They've said that they've identified it as Novichok. They cannot identify the source of it. And so either the Foreign Secretary has information that he's not sharing with Port and Down, or it was a bit of exaggeration. I don't know which it is, but I think we need a responsible, cool approach to this. We need to get to the source of this to prevent it ever happening again. So this all exposes how disgusting the rush to judgment of the Western powers has been. And that was put in a nutshell by Willy Wimmer, who is the formerly from Germany's Defence Ministry and also from the Organisation for Security and Cooperation. He made these comments at the Moscow Economic Forum going on now. But what the West European governments are doing is unbelievable under West European legal regulations. You are not guilty as long as your guilt is not proven. And when this is used against another government, this is an effort of West European countries, especially Great Britain, to destroy international peace. Yeah. And it is uh, unbelievable when you listen to one West European foreign minister, chancellor or ambassador, when you listen to one, you hear them all. They sound like brainwashed. So in response to this, the Russian Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova has said that the UK Foreign Office has just said that its decision to blame Russia was based on suspicions. Yeah, no evidence. Exactly. Um, now, the Russians have convened a special session of the Organisation for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, which is the agency that should be looking into this. So their Executive Council met on Wednesday and 13 formal questions were submitted by Russia, which they demanded answers to about the procedures that were used to identify the substances and everything else. And also a special, special session of the United Nations Security Council was convened by Russia yesterday. So we'll hear very soon what's come out of that. Um, Sergei Lavrov, the Russian Foreign Minister, said that if our British colleagues fail to answer the questions they have submitted, this would mean only one thing, um, that this is fiction, or to put it more bluntly, a gross provocation. Now, Craig, Australia was one of 28 countries that ejected Russian diplomats. We followed our ally, our dangerous ally, as Malcolm Fraser calls uh, the UK and the US, blindly. We cannot continue to do this. Right, Lisa, what strikes me is there's 195 countries in the world, of which only 28, which is the Western countries or Western affiliated countries, have come out and cast out these diplomats. The fact is that Russia has enormous credibility and support amongst many, many other countries. And this is the context in which the British have gone after Russia because they don't want that ex expanding influence continuing, where real development, real economic development is a subject matter of. Russia's interventions and support for these countries. Mm. And Australia should make a formal apology to the Russians actually and hold our judgement until the real analysis comes out on this story. So that's all we've got time for this week. Don't forget to call in for a copy, a complimentary copy of the Australian Alert Service. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks Craig. Yeah, thanks Alyssa. And join us again next week. Mm -hmm.